Hey everyone, welcome back to Public Speaking Online. This week will be a short lesson because most of your time will be spent completing an activity designed by one of our very own Sierra College librarians. On this week's page, you'll also find some fantastic resource links video tutorials, for example, to the Sierra College Library databases. And I really encourage you to pause, take some time, and browse through them just so you're more familiar with how to do Sierra College Library research. But for now, let's start our discussion. So why do we do research anyway? This might seem like a common sense and maybe even rhetorical question that I'm asking, but Let's pause and consider. First, for some, it's important that we engage in research simply for personal or professional knowledge so that we can become more well-rounded as critical thinkers and consumers of information. In the context of public speaking, it's important that we do research so that we can better support our claims, which in turn increases speaker credibility. It's also important, especially when giving a persuasive speech, that we are able to not only identify, but address potential opposing views or questions that could pop up from the audience. One thing that we know is that there are multiple types of evidence that work well to support our claims. And a good rule of thumb is to vary or mix different forms of evidence in your speech. For example, it would be perfectly appropriate to start your speech with a personal story showcasing your skill set or experience in a certain area, and then to complete and round out your evidence by adding academic research like stats or even doing interviews with practitioner or experts in a given field. Let's pause again on that personal and professional knowledge gain that we talked about a moment ago. It's important to realize that all your life experiences until now have truly made you an expert on multiple topics and you have something to say. Let's say, for example, that you've been eyewitness to a certain event or that you have an important story to tell or maybe many. Maybe you've had a really relevant professional, academic, or personal experience with a topic that you want to share about. And if you don't, that's fine too. You can always interview an expert in the subject area. So for your persuasive speech, do you know someone who works or maybe used to work for an organization that you want us to support? Go ahead and interview them and add their quotes. A good tip though. Be sure to write out your interview questions ahead of time. That way you don't get lost or sidetracked or spend too much time in the interview itself. Ask for permission always to quote and record your interview. That way you can go back to their quotes for quick reference later. Then put their quotes in full in your speech outline and give proper source citations. Now, maybe you've heard of scholarly references referred to as academic resources or peer-reviewed resources. It's all kind of the same thing. The good news is that Sierra College, both on ground and online, is a vast storehouse of all kinds of scholarly sources. And when I say scholarly sources here, I'm really talking about peer-reviewed journals, maybe books or ebooks films that you can access through our Films On Demand database, or even documentaries that you might find housed under Canopy at the Sierra College Library. Now, Canopy is its own database. It's kind of a Hulu of sorts for colleges. And we pay yearly subscriptions to be able to have these academic sources at our fingertips. You can also use newspapers, digital or print, as well as magazines. Although some magazines that are more popular than they are research-based might be a little bit questionable. But if you have a question, simply ask a librarian. On the Sierra College Library page, there's a live chat function where librarians can answer all your questions, both about research, processes, and topics. 
And there's more academic resources too, some that go unused. For example, encyclopedias or annual publications known in various disciplines as yearbooks, such as the World Almanac. For me, when I want to start a speech with a really powerful or even humorous quote, I've turned to quote books. Also, biographical aids and professional resources. Think about it. Maybe your company or job place has a manual, a guidebook, or training materials that might be relevant to your speech. Use them. You can also go the route of internet research. And the best way I have found to do that, if you really want to open up Pandora's box, is through Google Scholar. And I'll tell you more about that in a minute. We'll also talk about the differences between using Google Scholar and websites like .coms versus .orgs or .govs. Now maybe you've used Google Scholar in the past and you can always Google Google Scholar and this is what you would see. You can also click on the top right waffle looking icon and scroll down to where it says even more. Okay, click on there. And when you see this icon of what looks like a graduate, that's where you will now have access to, see, to the Google Scholar database. The Google Scholar database basically weeds out all of the dot-coms. So if you do a search, you'll get something like this. And you'll notice that there's often a link for you to download a particular article or maybe a research report. And there's even source information, the title, the author, a brief summary, what the works is about, and a little stat that tells you how many times it's been cited. I really recommend using Google Scholar if you prefer to use the internet over library research because it functions as a really good filter. Another good rule of thumb is to make sure that the research you're doing or finding is recent, as in the last six years recent. Okay, so let's move on to internet research now that we've gone over Google Scholar. I'm sure you know, but .coms stand for commercials. Now, anyone with a few bucks can buy an online commercial space. And I have a funny story I'm going to tell you in just a minute. The problem with .coms, which is not always the problem, but more often than not, is that they don't undergo the same rigorous process for publication than a .org, which stands for organization, or .gov, which stands for government. You could also find something published by a .edu, education, and that would also be something that was peer-reviewed and underwent a rigorous publication process. Here's the funny story I wanted to tell you, and then I'll tell you a little bit more about credibility. Let's just say I have a brother, and I do. And let's say that two decades ago, he went to Taco Bell and had a less than average experience because maybe they left out something from his order. Well, remember, this is a long time ago. He thought it would be funny if he went in and created a replica Taco Bell social media site simply by adjusting some of the font and some of the imagery in the Taco Bell logo. Now. We know better today, this was not ethical, and I do not condone his behavior. But here's the funny part. He purchased the .com, was able to create basically a fake Taco Bell social media site, and on it, put up an announcement that said, please go to your nearest Taco Bell by today at noon, where you will get a free chalupa. I'm not going to explain everything that unfolded after that, but you can imagine it was a little chaotic. And that was his sort of jab back at the company. I'm a big Taco Bell fan, so again, not super pumped that he did this. But here's the point. Dot coms, like I said, they're commercial sites. And they could be published by anyone, including my brother. So next time you're on a dot com, ask yourself, is this real or Tara's brother? Just something to think about. That then brings us back to source credibility. How do we really evaluate a website anyway? Well, there's a couple telltale signs that something fishy is going on. First, is the author even named? And if they are, can you look them up? Find out whether or not they're experts. Did the source, the .com, provide accurate and sound reasoning? Did they avoid some of the fallacies that we were talking about earlier? 
Did they provide evidence to support their claim from additional outside sources? Maybe the language was really sensory-laden or biased. If you can get done reading an article and ask yourself, how did this author want to make me feel and know the answer, chances are they were pushing an, an agenda or leaning a certain way, and there might be some bias in the article. Also, it's important to take a look at the copyright date and to make sure it's even posted. When was this thing published? Was it revised? How recently? And is it recent, as in within the last four to six years? You can imagine how quickly research becomes outdated and replaced with newer reports. So again, I hope that that helps when it comes to thinking about source credibility and how to use outside academic research. If you have any questions, feel free to let me know and contact me or ask one of the Sierra College librarians. Thank you.